Uh, ina mana, ina reo, i rau rangatira ma tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, Secretary Francis Addison, uh, Secretary of the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, uh, Secretary of the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Brooke Barrington, High Commissioner of Australia, Ewan MacDonald, uh, Professor Jennifer Windsor, Pro Vice Chancellor of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome. I'm David Cappy and I'm the Director of the Centre for Strategic Studies here at Victoria University of Wellington. And on behalf of the Centre and the University, it's my very great pleasure to welcome you to this lecture this afternoon, Australian Perspectives on the Indo-Pacific Region by Secretary Francis Adamson. Ladies and gentlemen, the weather forecast for Sydney today is shining sunshine and 23 degrees. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything more about that, but just to say that I think that underscores the diversity of this remarkable region we call home. Um, 2018 is a special year for the Centre for Strategic Studies. It marks the 25th anniversary of our founding. Uh, and as I keep telling my students, and frankly anybody who will listen, I don't think there has ever been a more interesting time to be thinking about the strategic change that's going on in our region. The Centre for Strategic Studies' mission is to promote an informed national conversation about New Zealand's foreign and defence policy and changes in our strategic environment. We do this through our research and teaching, but also through conferences, seminars, roundtables, and very happily through distinguished public lectures like this. Ladies and gentlemen, we're very fortunate to have the, the very good fortune to have with us today not just one Secretary of Foreign Affairs, but two. Uh, and uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Brooke Barrington uh, to make some opening remarks. Uh, Dr. Barrington has been the Secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade since March 2015, and before that served in senior leadership roles in the Ministry of Defence and in the Ministry of Justice and was our ambassador in Thailand. And as many of you all know, he was recently uh, named to be the next chief executive of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. So uh, that's a role he'll take up in February. So we're delighted to have you uh, with us here, Brooke. And it's my very great pleasure to ask you to, wel uh, to welcome Brooke, who will introduce our distinguished speaker. Tēnā koutou katoa. Good afternoon. It doesn't do to be a hamburger patty when fillet steak is on the menu. <clears throat> I won't detain you long. We live in pulsating times. Global power is being contested. There is significant pressure on the existing international system and on many of the principles and rules that underpin it. Pervasive challenges like climate change are fueling uncertainty. Global resilience has been weakened by rising debt and falling social license. Nationalism has left the wings and is back on stage. And in our own hemisphere, we are living through an unprecedented period of strategic dynamism of which more from Francis in a moment. How very like a diplomat to see the wine glass half empty, with no waiter in sight and a limited disposition for self-service. <laughs> there are offsets, of course. Global literacy is rising, global poverty is falling, and the most rapid expansion of the middle class in economic history is occurring within our reach. But predictability, one of the rivets of international affairs, is currently sprung. And the risks for a small country with global interests are acute. Aren't we therefore fortunate to have our nearest neighbour as our closest friend? And doubly fortunate, perhaps, that it is a friendship sustained not only by economic interdependence, but also by shared values, social connections, familiar institutions, national interests that are largely consonant, and the 2,000 kilometres of water that so conveniently sits between us. 
As Prime Minister Ardern recently said, and I quote, in this age of global power struggle and in this age of disinformation, we must cling to the heavily undervalued currency of loyalty, friendship and trust, end quote. Australia, then, is our indispensable ally and partner. They have always been this to us, even if sometimes we have confessed it only grudgingly. And perhaps in the midst of these pulsating times, we might look reassuringly stable to them. There might even be an occasionally wistful glance in our direction. Anyway, we need each other more than ever, and it is in our mutual benefit to keep the bonds of loyalty and friendship and trust shared between us free of corrosion. And so to Francis, the rare, a cut of the rarest kind. It is a privilege to introduce her. She is a gifted diplomat and a transformational leader. Frances has deep wells of experience, especially having served at senior levels in the wider China ecosystem, most recently as Australia's ambassador in Beijing, and serving in senior levels in the United Kingdom. She's been a trusted senior advisor to ministers and prime ministers on both sides of politics. She chaperoned through Australians for Australia's Foreign Affairs White Paper in 2016, helping adroitly to chart a course through turbulent international seas. She leads her department with vision and courage and has initiated important reforms around diversity and inclusion, women in leadership, innovation and risk management. And infusing all of this are her personal qualities. Frances combines knowledge with strategy principle with tactics, determination with humanity, and steeliness with humour. With that billing, it had better be a good speech, Francis, <laughs> please join me in welcoming Australia's Secretary of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Francis Adamson, to address us on Australia's perspectives on the Indo-Pacific. Kia ora tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa. Thank you very much indeed, Brooke. We'll, we'll, um, we'll compare notes at the end. I think you've set me a fairly big challenge, but you've done so with your characteristically warm generosity. We've spent a lot of time together in the last couple of years. Uh, we're very comfortable with each other. We value uh, the time that we spend and what we learn from each other, and that is uh, said with a great deal of... Uh, a feeling on my part. I, I know you're going on to other things and I, I hope we'll continue to remain in close contact. Uh, so thank you, Brooke, and my thanks to, to Dr David Cappy, Director of the Centre for Strategic Studies uh, at Victoria University for hosting us all here today in this beautiful Hunter Chamber. I want to acknowledge two members of the Diplomatic Corps and amongst the members of the Diplomatic Corps, of course, my own High Commissioner, Ewan MacDonald, as well as representatives from MFAT and from other government agencies, academics, of course, and, and I hope some students. There, there must be some students, right? There has to be. This, is a, this has to be, ah, yes, I'm getting, an, I'm getting an odd way, an occasional wave. And of course, uh, those of you who are students at this university will know many of the, the distinguished alumni, uh, some of whom I'm sure you're hoping to emulate. But I want to, I want to particularly mention Fred Hollows, who completed his undergraduate degree on this campus. Uh, no doubt what he learnt here inspired his work on avoidable blindness, work that has benefit, benefited so many people across this region. Uh, and I note, by the way, as with so many good people and good things, which each of us claim as our own, uh, that Fred Hollows was named as New one of New Zealand's top history makers in 2005 and as one of the 100 most influential Australians in 2006, having been 
but having been uh, Australian of the Year in 1990, so that probably settles it, but I simply cite that uh, as an example. And of course, as you all know, this university was established in 1897, at a time while across the Tasman, the colonies that were to make up the Australian Commonwealth were preparing for the birth of our modern nation. Back then, I believe that we were still trying to tempt you into the dream of common nationhood, an Australian federation extending out to a seventh state in New Zealand. Now, despite the years and the rivalries, we can very easily understand why the question was so passionately debated and why the idea was so tempting. We have our differences, but our commonalities. Our common interests far outweigh them. Our shared history and values have given Australia and New Zealand a special and enduring relationship. As partners in trade under the CER Bilateral Free Trade Agreement, in adventure exploring the Antarctic territories together, or vying, if indeed vying is the correct word these days, for the Bledisloe Cup. In my own experience, our partnership is especially valuable when it comes to the practice of foreign affairs. We are not among the great powers, and nor are we insignificant players. And this is reflected in the very foundation of our respective foreign policies. One could argue, and I do, that our diplomacy is all the more important today when we both find ourselves in the midst of changing global power dynamics that are, for the first time in modern history, anchored in the Indo-Pacific region. These shifts are fluid for reasons beyond our control, and so we must do what we can to influence them in favour of our national and regional interests. In both Canberra and here in Wellington, there can be a tendency sometimes to underestimate our power, our weight, the effectiveness of our diplomacy. My message today is that our nation, that a nation can have a tight foreign policy focus befitting its size and still have a major outsized impact on its international environment. Our strategies can and should both concentrate our efforts and leverage them for wider ends. We have already shown that it can be done. Australia and New Zealand have been successful in building linkages across the region to maximise security and prosperity in Asia and the Pacific. In 1989, for example, Australia's Prime Minister Bob Hawke first stood up the idea of a forum for Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, APEC. Since then, APEC has almost doubled in its membership and now represents over half of global GDP. To take another example, in the early 2000s, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Helen Clark, led her government through multiple rounds of trade negotiations with what was known as the P4, New Zealand, Singapore, Chile and Brunei Dar es Salaam. Four economies focused on increased trade liberalisation and working towards more open and more prosperous economic partnerships. Piece by piece, the vision of the P4 negotiations gained momentum, propelled forward most notably when former President Obama adopted them into the US's own trade agenda. Heady days, actually, they were, weren't they? By 2010, those negotiations had attracted so much interest that the world had started calling them the Trans-Pacific Partnership. After countless rounds and some serious setbacks, it was still New Zealand's leadership, together with Australia and Japan, that brought these negotiations over the line. In March this year, New Zealand, Australia, and nine other Pacific Rim economies signed the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, the CPTPP, a free trade agreement of unprecedented ambition. The CPTPP represents over $10 trillion US in GDP and offers the potential for better income and better living standards for hundreds of millions of people. 
You'd have to count that as a pretty impressive effort, New Zealand. The CPTPP is an open platform and Australia sees it as a step towards a wider free trade area. By setting the standard in international trade liberalisation, it offers a reference point for the future of trade policy, not just in our region, but globally, a vision anchored in the foundations of the universal WTO system. Our two countries are working to extend the trade architecture westwards as well, to include India. The Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP, negotiations, which include the 10 Southeast Asian nations of ASEAN, as well as China, Japan, Korea, India and ourselves, is an important piece in this picture. In fact, I understand the next round of negotiations will be held in Auckland. RCEP, once concluded, will create the world's largest free trade area, nearly one third of the world economy. 16 countries representing a great diversity of language, ethnicity, systems of government, able to come together under the umbrella of our shared geography with common goals for open, rules-based economic integration. It is a strong message that we, the Indo-Pacific, are sending to the world, and it is absolutely right that Australia and New Zealand are sending that message together and in the process amplifying it. Of course, it's not just about trade. As is the case in New Zealand, our region is a central focus of Australia's broader foreign policy agenda. Whether we refer to the Asia-Pacific or the Indo-Pacific, we both understand that our security and our prosperity depend on maintaining an open and inclusive and stable region. We are outspoken on the need to ensure our region supports rules-based international order and demonstrates the benefits of a liberalised trading system, particularly in the face of growing protectionism. Other nations, such as the US, Japan and India, are also talking and thinking about foreign policy to shape an open and stable Indo-Pacific as it undergoes rapid change, economic, demographic and technological. That change is producing an increasingly complex economic and political environment. In many ways, it's the root source of broader global transformation. And with economic dynamism comes strategic dynamism. The Indo-Pacific is the region where the great powers will largely determine the way that the international order evolves. In this, Australia and New Zealand can make a real difference as our parts, as we play our parts in APEC and the CPTPP and the work that we've done already there have demonstrated. There are many kinds of influence that we can exert or fail to exert that could, through their wider, sometimes unforeseeable consequences, have significant impacts on us and on our own domestic environments for the years ahead. With this in mind, we in Australia are aligning our resources to support our major goals in the Indo-Pacific. To choose the right goals, we have to understand what is happening in the region. There are three propositions that I'd like to put to you today which define our foreign policy content. Number one, we are in the midst of a major strategic realignment in the Indo-Pacific. This is not a matter of future possibility. It is happening right now as we speak, as we read in our news media each morning. Number two, we do not know how that realignment will play out. While in some respects competition has been intensifying, there are nonetheless viable avenues for a stable balance between competition and cooperation. Number three, we, Australia and New Zealand together, are in a position to help achieve this balance. We will have to be agile and forward thinking to make the most of the opportunities we have for influence, but we certainly have them. It is in our interest to work closely together 
and to make sure that we succeed in building an environment that is constructive to economic progress and political stability for Indo-Pacific nations, large and small. These core ideas, and they're teased out in the Australian Government's Foreign Policy White Paper, released almost a year ago now. We grappled then with the scale and the pace of change we're seeing today, and we're still grappling with them, even as they appear to be accelerating. Debate and discussion between partner governments and debate and discussion among the public is crucial to ensuring that our ongoing policy reviews remain agile and sharply relevant to the region as it evolves. At the core of it, Australia seeks an Indo-Pacific that is stable and prosperous. We support a region where countries engage in dialogue and resolve disputes peacefully in accordance with international law where open markets and economic integration allow societies to benefit from trade and the growth of jobs, income and skills through investment. Where major global powers remain engaged and play a constructive and consistent leadership role in strengthening regional institutions and norms. It is a first order priority for us to ensure that the geostrategic changes that are underway do not disrupt disrupt the stability that underpins our region's growing prosperity. In particular, the emerging role that China forges for itself will be pivotal to the future of the region. It is in our interests and the interests of our region that China fulfills its potential as a force for stability and prosperity and global problem solving. Australia also encourages strong US economic engagement in the region and we remain steadfastly committed to the US security presence, an important stabilising influence. Meanwhile, India remains the world's largest democracy and is now the world's fastest growing major economy. The scale of its transformation, nothing short of extraordinary. As India reckons with its own increasing strategic weight, Australia is seeking to ensure that our immediate economic relationship aligns with our deeper, longer-term interest in the role that India will surely play. Recognising this, the Australian Government commissioned the India Economic Strategy, authored by my predecessor Peter Varghese, also a former High Commissioner to India. It's a demonstration of our commitment to focus on India as a priority economic partner and to build a deeper cultural literacy across business and the community. Australia is likewise committed to a deeper engagement with the nations of Southeast Asia and with ASEAN, the collective voice of Southeast Asia and the geographic heartland of the Indo-Pacific, central to regional economic integration and cohesion and a contributor to the maintenance of our rules-based order. That is why Australia hosted the ASEAN Australia Special Summit in Sydney earlier this year, an historic event that deepened our cooperation for security and prosperity and has strengthened links between our people. Closer to home in the South Pacific, we find ourselves on well-trodden ground for trans-Tasman partnership and coordination. We understand that resilience, stability and prosperity in the Pacific Islands is a necessary element for the success of the broader Indo-Pacific. They go hand in hand. We and the Pacific Island countries share challenges, but we are addressing them as part of a shared agenda for regional opportunity and ambition, targeting priorities named by Pacific Islands leaders themselves. At last month's Pacific Islands Forum, New Zealand's Prime Minister and Australia's Foreign Minister were among the Pacific leaders who signed the Boy Declaration. This is a set of principles and of practical measures to ensure that we're all working together towards our common goal of security for the region, pooling resources, collaborating between governments, sharing information. Australia and New Zealand will play an important role in the months ahead as we implement the declaration through structured training, intelligence sharing and capability acquisition. 
The Boy Declaration also highlights climate change as the number one core threat for Pacific Island countries. Our two countries are working to address this challenge. I recognise New Zealand's announcement of 300 million New Zealand dollars over four years to tackle climate change with a focus on Pacific Island countries. In 2016, Australia likewise announced 300 million Australian dollars of our own over four years to combat climate issues in the Pacific, and we've expended almost $200 million of that already. What it's mainly been focused on is building resilience in the face of climate change and national disaster. The Boy Declaration is a significant step forward. However, in many ways, it also represents continuity. New Zealand and Australia have always invested in the Pacific Islands, and we've always trusted each other to make sure that our region is supported whenever that support is needed. To take the stark example of humanitarian assistance, our joint deployments following tropical cyclones Winston in Fiji and Gita in Tonga were vital in supporting national response efforts. At a time when the risk of devastation by natural disaster in our region has increased, we look to you as our closest partners. We recognise, for instance, the New Zealand government's decision to, to acquire P-8A Poseidon Maritime Patrol aircraft and the value that that decision will bring to our joint efforts in the years to come. We've both announced major new policy initiatives over the past 12 months, New Zealand's Pacific Reset and Australia's Pacific Step Up, which for each of us represents our largest ever aid investment in the Pacific. Equally, we celebrate our region's strengths and achievements. We look forward, for example, to Papua New Guinea welcoming world leaders next month as host of 2018 APEC Leaders Meeting. The Pacific Islands are indeed enjoying increased global interest. Traditionally, we've worked well alongside the US, Japan, the EU, particularly France, and now increasingly the United Kingdom. China too has a long history in the Pacific and its partnerships are evolving and deepening with increased engagement. We want all countries engaging in the Pacific to bring capital and skills and opportunity in ways that strengthen the sovereignty of individual Pacific Island countries and the autonomy of the region as a whole. That engagement, of course, can take a number of forms. For example, investing in high quality infrastructure, which we recognise is important to maintain growth and prosperity, both in the Pacific and in Asia more broadly. Australia is currently preparing a major new infrastructure partnership with the United States and Japan to facilitate private sector involvement in infrastructure projects that are transparent, non-discriminatory and free from the burden of unsustainable debt. Indeed, cooperation is part of a mutual effort to defend, renew and establish international norms with wider significance. We seek New Zealand's help to strengthen this regional architecture as partners, amongst other partners, shaping an evolving international order. The value that the Australian government places on New Zealand as a partner in supporting such norms cannot be overstated. That's true of our immediate neighbourhood and that's true of the broader Indo-Pacific. For example, we share a common agenda for human rights, a global issue with an important Indo-Pacific dimension. We look to our partnership when advocating globally on human rights issues, such as the death penalty, gender-based rights, or ethnic violence. These are important issues for Australia and New Zealand, and they're important issues for long-term stability and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific. Let me conclude by saying it's very hard to think of another two partners working as closely in so many respects as our two countries do. In the spirit of that partnership, I'm committed to ensuring that the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade works closely with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade in seeking to understand and respond to the challenges we face today and that we will face in future. A question of sharing information, 
sharing insights, sharing perspectives to lead our nation's wider collaboration and to shape our international environment, something I've been really pleased to do with Brooke Barrington yesterday and today and indeed on many occasions over the past two years. Australia and New Zealand share the core principles that define our national identities and determine our foreign engagement. Respect for civil liberties, open economies, stable governance. In the past, we've shown the world that together and independently, we can build from these principles to influence our region so that it is integrated, inclusive and open to the world. We've laid some important groundwork but as the Indo-Pacific transforms itself around us, the test is now whether we can build on it, whether we can realise an even more ambitious shared vision for our region. Thank you. Please, I uh, thank you very much for that terrific set of remarks. Uh, I'm very grateful that uh, Secretary Adamson has agreed to take some questions. We, uh, she has a plane to catch, but we have uh, uh, about uh, 15 or 20 minutes for some questions. And so I wonder if I can open the floor for uh, questions. Please. Yes. Wondering why do you use the term Indo-Pacific? Um, it seems to be a, a, a neologism. Uh, do, you, do you intend to downgrade the importance of China, or, or what's your thinking behind that? Well, I think if you look at Australia's geography, you see that our western shores are washed by the Indian Ocean and our eastern shores are washed by the Pacific Ocean. So part of it just has to do the, with the practical realities of geography. Uh, I don't think the, I mean, these terms are not uh, intended in any way to downgrade anything. I mean, our, our region is as our region. Uh, we have been particularly focused for a number of decades now, I suppose, on the Asia-Pacific. But the strategic importance of the Indian Ocean is becoming clearer. And so too, I mean, I, the reason I devoted perhaps a little more attention to India than I did to some other individual countries was in terms of change. There is no doubt that India is also rising, that Australia's economic engagement is, with India is strengthening across the Indian Ocean. And of course, a range of countries in our region, each I think driven by their individual circumstances, you know, whether it is uh, uh, the Japanese with the free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, I notice the, the Americans have uh, now have renamed uh, Pacific Command, Indo-Pacific uh, Command. The Indians themselves have had a, a look east policy for a number of years. I think ASEAN, and we would see, I should emphasize, ASEAN is absolutely central to any any concept of the Indo-Pacific, the ASEANs themselves, are, themselves, I think, are becoming more seized of all of this too. So while we might you know, interpret it in slightly different ways, I think the Indians themselves would extend the Indo-Pacific as far as East Africa. We'd probably be a little bit more conservative in terms of where we draw the line. But this is the region that is generating growth. This is the region where it is so vital to maintain stability. And this is the region we need to be concentrating on, as including, including as, we, uh, as we develop norms as, and as we seek to ensure uh, that uh, where there are differences, they're settled in accordance with international law. Yeah, please, Gary. Uh, thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, Gary Domingo, Philippine Ambassador. And thank you very much for your, very, um, for your presentation. Very, uh, very informative, and it, it helps me with my expected reports for the week. But okay, <laughs> just um, thank you so much for affirming ASEAN centrality in all of this. Uh, this quick question. What do you see as the role of our other friends in the region? For example, Korea, mm -hmm. Russia, say, European Union, British Commonwealth, Latin America, Canada. Any of those. Okay, thank you. Well, that's a very good question and always happy to help out a fellow diplomat when it comes to reporting back to, uh, to capitals. I mean, we, we're talking about uh, you know, an open region, an inclusive region, and that obviously means a role not only for those geographically anchored in this region, but for a range of other partners as well. And we, you know, we find ourselves at this time of year 
on the verge again of summit season, uh, which uh, by design brings in in dialogue partners brings in a wider range of partners, sometimes in slightly different configurations. That's a, a, a historical outcome of uh, discussions and debates over, over architecture. But I think, you know, we've seen economic weight shifting to the region, we've seen strategic weight globally shifting to our region and within our region, uh, but we are not unmindful at all uh, of the global economy and global interests. So I think, you know, there are there are roles for a wide range of partners. The reality, though, is that some conversations, you know, the, the East Asia Summit, for example, we think are probably best conducted with the you know, current members at the table. There are a range of others uh, who would like to be at the table, but we've always thought it was important that there be an opportunity for leaders, leaders of countries in our region to get together and to be able to talk about a wide range of issues, including where necessary, security and strategic issues. Please, Les. Uh, yes, uh, Les Holmer, you making the question. I should probably make it clear that I have been president of the Institute of International Affairs in Brisbane, the Australian Institute, as well as president of the New Zealand Institute. Mm -hmm. But I'm a little bit worried by the glib statements that have been made about our sharing common liberal values. Now, it's clear, as your address made uh, evident, mm -hmm. that we do share a lot of values. But I'm not alone, I think, as a New Zealander, and I know there are some Australians, because we had an eminent one here recently, who are worried about whether Australia is still fully committed to the whole package of Western liberal values. And when we look at the way uh, refugees are being treated in Nauru and previously in Papua New Guinea, the most recent example, of course, being the withdrawal of services, psychiatric services to children detained in Nauru. And when we hear one of your eminent ministers recently saying that Australians can't afford to be humanitarian in places like this, we do start to get worried. Now, can you reassure us about that? I can reassure you. Yeah, please, Helen. Thank you. Helen Smith, I'm the British Deputy High Commissioner. Secretary, thank you for your comments. Um, you talked a bit about India specifically and the need to build deeper cultural literacy, both within and outside government. I wondered if you could just say something else about the skills that you see as Secretary for Foreign Affairs that diplomats will need to address um, some of the challenges in the Indo-Pacific this century. Well, I mean, I think in many respects the, the, the skills that diplomats need are the skills that diplomats have always needed in, in many respects. And it is, a, it is a profession that's developed over centuries, as you know, but, but deep cultural understanding, the ability, obviously highly desirable to speak uh, languages, and including the languages of our immediate region. That's one of the things that Brooke and I were talking about this morning. Uh, within the, the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and we do, by the way, we've, we've, it's been all about Australia and New Zealand today, but in terms of foreign ministries and the way we run them, uh, you know, Brooke and I have had a, an ongoing dialogue with Simon MacDonald, the, the Foreign Office Permanent Undersecretary with our Canadian counterparts, and from time to time, US and other partners. I think there are challenges for foreign services in the 21st century. I mean, governments uh, expect us to achieve ever more with within a pretty constrained resources envelope. But in terms of the messages I'm sending my own colleagues is we want them to, uh, to develop uh, capabilities. I talk about capability anchors. Some services talk, talk about them as career anchors. But we certainly need, within an integrated Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, having celebrated uh, just last year the 30th anniversary of the amalgamation with trade, we'll shortly be celebrating the fifth anniversary of the integration of AusAid into the department. So, you know, we need the world's best trade neg negotiator. So does New Zealand. I mean, there is so much at stake in all of that. We've got to be able to, de to deliver development assistance in ways that meet the, um, the changing needs of the region. And although there's a lot of focus on you know, formal graduation through the various stages 
of uh, you know, least developed countries and above, we now realise that in our own region, this applies particularly to Southeast Asia, there is an ongoing need for us to work together when it comes to economic reform, when it comes to, to governance, when it comes to a range of areas. So I see sort of great career opportunities for diplomats, but they are, we are going to need increasing uh, sort of expertise developed over over uh, lifetimes, as well as those uh, wonderful generalist skills that Brooke and I uh, find ourselves needing to call on on a daily basis when something needs to be fixed or when uh, skills need to be transferred or when we need to manage all of this agenda. But a lot of it actually is an increasingly shared agenda when it comes to elements of corporate work and elements of what we would both reluctantly, I think, but nevertheless call, call culture. Peter Harris from the New Zealand Contemporary China Research Centre. Thank you, Secretary, for uh, such a, a broad and interesting survey. And may I congratulate you, too, on doing the survey without once mentioning the names of Donald Trump or Xi Jinping. <laughs> on that score and beyond that score, could you please tell us, since you've talked about stability, what you and the Australian government regard as the principal potential sources of instability over the next five to ten years? Mm -hmm. Well, I think you're you're a debt, Peter, at reading between the, the lines, and my uh, my speech will be on a, on the website shortly. You can uh, further study those uh, between the lines aspects if you like. But I think you know we would we would see. Uh, I mean, I referred in a way to the work we've done on the white paper, and I spoke about you know some of these trends accelerating, and the the, the trends, the negative trends being you know protectionism, rising nationalism. You know, I think where there is, coming to our own region, where there are you know, disputes between nations where they go to, to matters of territory, there is always a risk potentially of miscalculation and that's why we continue to, uh, to emphasise the importance of the rules-based order and good and strong communication. And, and I would, it's an obvious point now to acknowledge the work that has been done uh, by the members of ASEAN and China on seeking to develop a, a code of conduct for the South China Sea. And of course there are aspects of that notwithstanding neither Australia or New Zealand are, are claimants there. We both have a, a very strong interest in the maintenance of uh, a freedom of navigation and the South China Sea remaining peaceful and the rights of, of competing states that, that are contested being able to be uh, accessed uh, or being able to be settled peacefully. Of course, there are some uh, some looming threats, and perhaps they're not so looming. They're a bit closer than we might have thought they'd be. And I, I acknowledge that in this room there is a great deal of expertise in the very area that I'm talking about, including Charles Finney, uh, who I acknowledge sitting there a second from the back. We served together a, a while ago in a country of this region or in an area of this region that is uh, relevant to what we're talking about. Uh, but I, I do think the, uh, the trade issues that are becoming sharper between China and the United States not just bear very close watching. I mean, we've been sort of active in our own diplomacy and talking to both sides. I think, you know, in the course of today, I've had a sense of some of the negative consequences that are already being felt in New Zealand about that. There are some in Australia as well too. So, you know, potential for major power rivalry is something that we shouldn't just regard as an academic exercise. Of course, that's there. Uh, but we, what we hear consistently from leaders across the region is their desire to maintain a peaceful and stable region where, uh, you know, Brooke talked about hundreds of millions of people are lifted out of poverty. There are still hundreds of millions more waiting to be lifted out of poverty. So I think uh, there's, there's certainly that, and I should add to, I don't want to end up with a laundry list, but, you know, the, the situation on the Korean Peninsula, while uh, rather less threatening at the moment than it was, say, a year ago, is nevertheless something that we need to be uh, seized of. And from Australia's perspective, we're continuing to, uh, to seek to implement UN sanctions and to encourage our close partners to do, to do likewise. Not just close partners all across the region, there's still work to be done there. I wonder if I could ask a question. One of, of the, um, 
one of the uh, one of the clubs or the groups that's most associated with this idea of the Indo-Pacific, yeah. or that's increasingly associated with the idea of the Indo-Pacific, is the Quad. Mm -hmm. This uh, form, nascent form of cooperation between yeah. Australia, United States, Japan, and India. Um, it's not been without its difficulties in terms of, uh, of getting going. I wonder if you could give us a sense of where you th what Australia sees as the the role of the Quad. Uh, mm -hmm. in this Indo-Pacific balance that you talked about? Sure. Well, look, I, I mean, I would, uh, I would seek from the, from the outset, in a way, to distinguish, you know, the quad from, from the Indo-Pacific as a concept. I would also seek, or I'd also make very clear that, that no um, mini-lateral, and, and a quad really is a sort of mini-lateral arrangement. We've got, you know, everyone understands multilateral. Um, Everyone understands bilateral, trilateral. Once you start to be get beyond trilateral, you get into sort of minilateral and plurilateral. But what we're really talking about is small groups, of small uh, countries coming together in relatively small groups. There can be no talk of really of containment or indeed particularly of balancing. But there are when those four countries, when when Australia. In the United States and Japan come together. We obviously have good conversations as democracies in this region, and we talk about, we swap notes, we compare uh, uh, points of view and assessments of what's happening in our region and how we might respond to it. So I, in terms of the quad going forward, I think where we are now after a couple of meetings and looking into the future is we'll, we'll just normalise the, uh, the uh, arrangement that we have uh, to the point where it won't be remarkable uh, as it continues to meet on a, on a regular basis. So I think it's, it's got rather a lot of attention, it's true, but uh, just as we, Australia and New Zealand, meet with a range of, of countries in different settings, in different formats, in different geometry, so too do other countries in the region. I was in uh, India not so long ago for a two plus two with my uh, Defence Secretary colleague, and on that, I think the day before, the foreign ministers of China, Russia, and India had met. Uh, you know, China is, uh, as are all of the other members, active in the BRICS, you know, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, at a time when there is uncertainty, at a time when uh, all of us are being challenged in a variety of ways. It helps to sit down and exchange perspectives, not just with, with like-minded, actually, as we once termed it, but with, within a broader, broader group. And we all do that uh, in an open, respectful way without seeking to, uh, to, to throw down challenges or seek to contain. It should just be regarded as a, as a natural grouping of like-minded's that will happen with... Um, Regularity. Yeah, Peter. Sorry, Australian Defence Force member and Victoria uh, student as well. Okay. Um, you talked about uh, the rules-based international order, yeah. uh, nationalism, and I guess nationalism is perhaps a, a threat to that in terms of uh, bilateral agreements, which a lot of countries are moving to now. Multilateralism is, I guess, a, a key to supporting the rules-based international order. Yeah. Where do you see Australia's relationship with Indonesia going and how important is that, I guess, in terms of their leadership in ASEAN <laughs> and also their growing economy? Okay, well, no, that's a, that's a very good question. I haven't spoken specifically about Indonesia, but thank you for giving me the opportunity to do so because it's a hugely important relationship for Australia and I think quite important for New Zealand also. And that was demonstrated when Prime Minister Morrison visited New Zealand. It has to be said, as it was intended, that Prime Minister Turnbull would have done, but within a week of, of being sworn in. And while there, he was able to, with President Widodo, uh, reach the formal agreement to have us become comprehensive strategic partners and also to formally conclude the negotiations on a an Indonesia-Australia closer economic partnership agreement. And they're the sorts of things one does only with close partners, but we recognise that there is, that the uh, Indonesian economy is growing, growing very quickly, uh, that it's the largest Muslim majority nation in the world, that it has uh, a tremendous strategic importance to Australia and, as you say, a very significant, a leading role to play in ASEAN. So, uh, you know, I think 
as with Indonesia, as with a range of countries, uh, we have come together in a reasonably like-minded way and we'll need to continue to do that. So our interests are very aligned. The relationship has been very close. It's not, not without challenge from time to time, but I think both sides have been uh, very clear about the need to be able to, to manage those uh, and while recognising, again, the broader point about ASEAN centrality. Please. Okay, Secretary. I'm Kelly Big from the New Zealand Navy. Um, at the Maritime Security Symposium, also hosted by the Centre for Strategic Studies in May, mm -hmm. one comment was made that the international rules-based order, the rules on which we rely, are based on Western society values. Do you think there is the potential that the rules will shift, and what will the implications be in coming years? Well, I think I'd probably... It's a, it's a very good question, Kelly. I'd sort of take issue with them being based on sort of Western society values because actually uh, a, you know, a number of these things are, are universal and they've, I think unquestionably, they've underpinned peace and stability globally since the end of the Second World War. So everyone has benefited from that. And you can actually, I think, mark, make a, mount a very respectable argument that emerging powers, wherever they are, and there are a number of them globally, have benefited from such a system too. But it doesn't mean that we talk about the definite article rules-based order uh, unable to adjust and locked in time at all. I think you know, we need to uh, have a conversation, and we are, about various adjustments that might need to be made, challenges that are emerging in new areas that might not be uh, covered satisfactorily by uh, international law in its existing form and you know space and cyber are a couple of examples but we also need to be adjusting to the reality of the growing strategic weight of various members of the international community and whether that means adjusting IMF quotas as eventually was done or whether it means other potential changes uh, they should be on the agenda notwithstanding the fact that uh, you know, in some respects, it gets harder to reach agreement multilaterally with everyone in the room. That's one of the reasons that's driven at least some momentum around the plurilateral aspects, which enable those who want to agree, leaders in, you know, in uh, within APEC or within the World Trade Organization, to sort of simply get on with it. There does need to be a broader conversation, and I don't think we need to bring the whole house down to have that conversation. Well, I think that brings us to the end of our uh, Q&A. Thank you so much for answering such a broad range of questions. I'd now like to ask the High Commissioner for Australia and New Zealand, Ewan Donald, to come forward and offer some concluding Thank remarks. Thanks very much. No. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, thank you, David. And um, Tina Kota Katora, uh, I've been here for seven months now um, as the Australian High Commissioner and I suppose I've learnt uh, very quickly uh, not to try and summarise particularly uh, concisely after two of the best foreign policy thinkers have been in front of me uh, in Brooke and Francis. So I wanted to, uh, to thank them both first off. Um, but I also wanted to say that this morning we've had a formal meeting between New Zealand and Australia here, uh, led by Francis and Brooke. And one of the things that struck me as part of that meeting and also the speech today was how common uh, a lot of the issues are that we're dealing with. And not only that, that we have shared interests and shared objectives on most of those, not all, but most. Uh, and that's what you'd expect. Um, I suppose some points that came out of it for me uh, during this speech was the changing global dyna dynamics which are anchored in our region and I think you know as Francis says that's pretty much the first time for history but it's it's centered there right now it's it's here with us uh, the other is as smaller countries middle power countries however you want to term it uh, sometimes uh, we can underestimate the impact or the influence we can have. So I think that's another a key plank. And I think the examples that were provided throughout uh, demonstrated that. Uh, we've also had, um, I think, come through quite clearly the common goals of open markets and rules-based order. And they're under challenge. And I think that came through 
uh, clearly as well. And I think we see that day in, day out, the idea of uh, inward looking and some of the impact that would have on Australia and New Zealand uh, as well. And I think there's no doubt we both desire a stable and prosperous region. So we're very much, I think, in a shared position on that as well. And finally, for me, I think what's come through uh, during the time I've been here, and certainly in today's speech uh, and comments, is there's high value in collaboration, in sharing views and information, and for us to be working together on our shared objectives, and together we can make more of a difference than we can on our own. And finally, I'd like to thank Jennifer and David uh, for hosting here today. And I'd also very much like to thank all of you. This is a fantastic number of people here. So thank you very much for coming out on this beautiful day, as David summarised earlier. Uh, but it's great to see people here and the interest that you have uh, in foreign policy. And of course, thanking very much my secretary, uh, Francis Adamson for not only being here, but also taking the time to engage with you all today. So thank you all very much. Thank you very much, High Commissioner. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of uh, the formal part of our uh, public lecture uh, for this afternoon. I think in his introductory remarks, Brooke set the bar uh, very high for what we could expect uh, in the speech from the Secretary, but I think you'll all agree that it was more than exceeded. We had a terrific uh, and really thoughtful address uh, uh, from Secretary Adamson this afternoon. And, and as somebody who tries to make sense of what governments are doing and tries to make sense of, of what is going on in the wider Asia-Pacific region, or Indo-Pacific region, uh, I'm, enormously, uh, I'm enormously encouraged to think of the, of the senior officials we have on both sides of the Tasman who are thinking very deeply about these very complex challenges that we face at the moment. But I'm even more grateful for the fact that we have senior officials who are prepared to come out and speak and put these thoughts on the public record for us to comment on, to read, to digest, and to debate. So, um, Secretary Adamson, um, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to invite everybody through in a minute to join us for refreshments in the other room, but just a cu couple of quick votes of thanks. First of all, I'd like to thank High Commissioner uh, Ewan MacDonald, uh, Deputy High Commissioner Andrew Cumston. The High Commissioner is a tremendous friend of the Centre for Strategic Studies uh, and a valuable support. Support, and we're grateful for your support with this event today. I'd also like to thank Brooke for finding time to be here today and for the Ministry's support for the Centre for Strategic Studies. But ladies and gentlemen, most of all and most importantly, I'd like to thank our distinguished guest, Francis Adams Adamson, for braving the elements uh, and also for giving us a lot to think about with a really terrific address. So please join with me in thanking once more Secretary Francis Adamson. Thank you.